Welcome once again to the Russell Brown Show. In this episode, I'm going to be sitting down and chatting with none other than Greg Gorman, an incredible photographer. In fact, he is one of the remaining last incredible classic photographers in the world. They do not make photographers like Greg anymore. So I'm now going to dial him up. Greg, there you are. Through the magic of science and technology, I am in your studio. How the heck are you doing? I'm great. It shows I'm just a touch away. I'm doing good, <laughs> Russell. Greg, I have brought you here today to talk about something I think is really exciting. It's your upcoming book, It's Not About Me. I've loved your photography over the years. I've selected some of my favorite photographs from your book, Greg. I wanted to sit down with you and show you those images and get some behind the scenes secrets to some of these movie stars and actors and musicians and maybe some tips and techniques on photography. What do you think? I think that sounds like a great idea. Why don't you just ask away? First question, was it really Jimi Hendrix who got you into the business? Yeah, Jimmy and I were not that close personally, but I borrowed a friend's camera back in 1968 to shoot a Jimi Hendrix concert, and that was the very first time I picked up a camera. And uh, the following morning, I went to my buddy's home in his little dark room, and when the pictures came up in a tray or on a white sheet of paper, I was hooked. So he certainly was the uh, impetus for the beginning of my career. So, Greg, here's my first photograph. This embodies everything about boy and everything about you and everything about a great black and white, a solid black, a really crisp white. Tell us about David Boy um, and this photograph. Well, David was great. We had a long run together, 10, 12 years, maybe a little bit longer. And uh, when I was first asked by Bruce Weber's sister actually was his publicist and uh, she asked me if I'd like to shoot David, and it was like, you know, kind of a uh, rhetorical question. I said, I think that would probably be the most awesome thing for me. It was the beginning of my career. This was not our first shoot, but our second or third shoot in New York City around 1984. You bring up across a comfort and trust to these stars. Talk to me about comfort and trust and getting a movie star or a musician to feel comfortable around you to take photographs. Well, as you and I've discussed, Russell, I think it really, boils down to coming up or down to their level to win their trust and confidence. And it's by sharing your vision with the artists while you're shooting. I spend time with them in the makeup room while they're getting their hair and makeup done. We usually break bread. My chef usually cooks a meal. So it's a question of making them feel like they're you're playing for their team, so to speak. I think today, so many photographers are more caught up in their personal image of what they shoot rather than having it as a shared vision. Do you feel casual around, you know, somebody uh, like um, Michael Jackson, how do you, how, you are relaxed the moment the person steps in the room. I'd be as nervous as heck and, and would blow the photography because the personality has come in the room. Well, that's something you have to be very, very much aware of because basically celebrities are far more comfortable playing a character other than themselves. And when it comes time to strip them bare of the characters you see on the big screen and they have to figure out who they're supposed to be, um, if you make them feel nervous, you're not going to get a good picture. So it's about making them feel like you're in control, so to speak, and you know exactly what you're doing, because otherwise then they're a nervous wreck, just as you predicted. This is a classic photo. Um, I think you've said to me that um, Michael comes in with a vision of something on his mind, and he steps in and takes this pose. H how much are you taking control? He came in a lot of times with concept, which is one of the things I loved about Michael. Uh, two weeks prior to our mini shoots, he would call and we would discuss ideas and thoughts that he had in mind. For this one particularly, was based on that famous, I think it's a Stieglitz picture uh, with Gloria Swanson, and he loved that. So my stylist got the netting, and then of course, positioning has all about me, how to get the angles right, get his head position right. And then we kind of took it from there. This was supposed to be the cover for Bad, but uh, the record cover uh, record company felt it was too feminine for them to put this on the cover of Bad, which is interesting. And it was used later for a retrospective after his passing. Um, Greg, this is a photograph. It's your long lost cousin, right? John yeah. Glass. <laughs> Stop <laughs> it. <laughs> I, I, I want those glasses. This is from your LA iWorks uh, photo shoot, isn't it? 
It is indeed. This is actually one of the early ads we did because in the early ads we did, I did over 200 ads for them. In the beginning, they shot pictures with some of their private collection, which are antique glasses, which is what's on, on this performance artist of John Sex. Again, this photograph embodies a solid black and a, and a beautiful white. Ay, 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 ay. No one knows how to do this anymore. I've, it, it, it's blow out, bring out the shadows. We can't see his ear. Let's open up the shadows because we can. It's all about the Kodak moment. I mean, they were always about how much detail do we have? You know, it's like, even when you and I started together and it was like, well, how many, how, what, where, what is your black point at? Do you have at least a five or a seven? And are you at 250, not 255 in your white point? For me, it's about the image. It's not about numbers. It's about how do I frame a face? Yes, gorgeous shot. And then one of your classic shots, um, look at that black. You can just fall into that black. It, that black's like a piece of fine chocolate. <laughs> Andy was a character. I mean, uh, the ads that we shot for LA Iwerks appeared every month in, LA, in uh, Interview Magazine. And in 1986, when Andy signed with Ford Models, he called me up and asked if he could actually be in an ad. And this picture, which was taken for an advertising campaign, actually became my most iconic image. Yeah. It's such a classic. And then I was looking at the contact sheet and I'm- Very diverse. <laughs> I'm saying to myself- Big range. <laughs> did he move? <laughs> no range. What a character. I teased Andy. I said, Andy, to quit moving around, hold still. And as you can see, he didn't move a muscle. What a crazy character. Which led to this image. Did Dustin Hoffman really pay for your house? <laughs> he did indeed, actually. It was uh, 1982, 81, I guess. I was working on, on uh, the movie Tootsie, and Dustin was promised uh, a day where he could shoot whatever he wanted for the, with the director, Sidney Pollack. And Dustin said to me, he says, Greg, he told uh, Sidney Pollack, the director, I want to do a photo shoot with Greg in the movie, which I'm actually in Tootsie. Yes. And then Dustin went on to ask me, who do you know that's famous that can come down and be in the movie this day? First, I asked David Bowie, so your timing with your imagery selection, Russell, is perfect. But David couldn't come down because he was getting his highlights done. But Andy, who was right at the corner from where we were shooting near, near uh, Union Square, came over and posed uh, with Dustin and was in the movie and later wrote in his diaries that I cheated him out of his day rate. So in Pat Hackett's book, which is kind of funny. Jane Fonda. Right. Um, this was, I'm not sure the name of the movie. I want to say The Morning After. I'm not sure. It's a movie she did with Jeff Bridges. And this was in my home, as you probably can recognize, uh, Russell. She's still in this good a shape now at 80. I mean, this gal is still rocking. Some natural light, some... Yeah, combination of natural light and a soft fill from the left side of camera left. The camera left is a small soft box. And then uh, a slow shutter speed, which was bringing in that ambient light through the dated glass brick window, which has now been changed. And there's that classic grain. What what type of film are you using here? Film? Film? <laughs> Do they remember what we used to shoot, Russell? Uh, this was probably shot, believe it or not, with Panatomic X, huh. which was my favorite film. I think the ISO was, tw or ISO, ASA was 25. Oh my goodness. Very fine grain. It was my favorite film. I'm taking me back to, it's 1973 and I'm in high school and I'm using, it was just Tri-X. Oh, I loved Tri-X, pushing Tri-X, pulling Tri-X, underexposing, overexposing, overdeveloping. And as you can see, Greg, it didn't affect me at all. No, exactly. <laughs> all those chemicals seeping into us. Um, Hitchcock, Hitchcock, what's the story here? What, what's going on here, Greg? Well, I wish it was a more glamorous story, Russell, but honestly, uh, I took a course while I was going to film school at USC called Thursday Night at the Movies. And Arthur Knight, who was the uh, film critic for Playboy, he wrote the sex and cinema column for Playboy, he would bring in a legendary director or a famous movie star and their current film. And Hitchcock brought in his one of his last movies, if not his last movie, I guess, Frenzy and screened it and afterwards was talking about it. And I just went up and this was against the white screen and snapped this picture. How did he respond when you snapped that picture? Was he, a, did he enjoy that? Was he? I think he was answering questions, so I don't even know that he was that aware. Yeah, he, wa he wasn't disturbed by someone taking a picture of him in any way. I don't think so. Yeah, what a classic shot. And the angle of that couldn't even be better. Very Alfred. <laughs> Very Alfred. Tell me about this. 
I think this was, a, well, I wasn't sure what this was. Either was Paul, and I talked to him about it, and he thinks we shot this. This is how old we're all getting. Paul said he thought this was uh, for a non, uh, non-smoking non because he doesn't smoke cigarettes. That would make sense. Yeah. Uh, that Paul would do this. But it's so out of character. It's so beautiful in the smoke and everything about it. The, the eyes, the, the exactly. face. Exactly. Hilton John... And film again. These are the film days. Um, All these are films so far. Yeah. Yeah. That, yeah. Oh gosh. Grain. Grain. You know the thing. I, I one of the I learned so much working on this book um, and the length of time I put into it is like when I went back and reviewed 160 boxes, which were in cold storage where I probably belong, and I'd look <laughs> at some <laughs> I'd look at some of these pictures, Russell. Um, I really realized one thing: the film was never that precise. You know, this idea of clarity yeah. and all these things, I mean, where we can take things to the ultimate. There's a certain charm and uh, uh, integrity to the lack of precision with film that I think is beautiful. This was taken in natural light in a daylight studio in London, actually. These next two images, Greg, I was noticing something, um, composition in your in your book, this moving the subject off center, stops you and uh, it's it's well, i think it creates a little bit of tension pushing the uh, uh images to the edge of the frame as opposed to being in the center where it's like a simply too balanced for me you know i think this gives the picture much more impact your eye immediately because of all this negative space goes right to the subject whereas sometimes when the picture's in the middle it just kind of teeter tots back and forth for me anyway so just like this image here's george burns off center with a strong white negative space, this positive space, I guess, over here to the right. Tell me about this photograph. Well, this is also something fun to talk about, Russell, because uh, you know from coming up to my classes in Mendocino, a lot is done, besides how you shoot, it's how you crop and interpret a picture after after you shoot it. A lot of it's about composition. And in this case, my creative director, Gary Johns, who's the uh, edit, uh, editor and, and creative director for my book, took a very ordinary picture of George that was kind of shot center stage, exactly what I was preaching against, and pushed him to the side and cropped in to give us a more powerful image. Yeah. So by pushing him to the left from a picture that was probably centered to begin with, and honestly, digitally adding a little white to the right-hand side of the frame, although this was shot film, uh, makes the picture more impactful, I think. Yes, yeah. I, have, I look at it and I don't question why you did it, and that's the sign of a, a great photograph, a classic. Speaking of classics, Sophia Loren, and um, Greg, everything about this photograph, the, like, there it is, that, that those blacks, um, really solid, not much detail there. It, what's this background back there? Is that something you dropped in? Uh, no, that's no. This is a straight out of the camera shot, and and a rare shot for me where I don't either bring a background out or and all that. But it's just the, this moment, and it's just it it nailed the angle of her face, the sunglasses as you we talked about last week, yeah. and the hair. It's just all all the elements kind of fall into line here, and it just shows she's sixty years old. Uh, the day we took this picture at lunch, she looked at me and she said to me, she said. You know, Greg, I'm a not a really a 60. I'm a three times a 20, which was very much <laughs> Sophia, you know. You've got a light coming down from above, catching that jawline just perfectly. Yeah, give me a real hard shadow and give, creating that jawline. And uh, I, I love this shot, too. Uh, you picked some of my favorite shots. The irony is that this book is probably a half color and half black and white. So those that are expecting a straight black and white book from me are gonna be surprised. It's the first time I've ever put a book out there that's been about half color and half black and white, so. Sorry, I only chose the black and well, white. Well, I love black and white. So you, you can't go wrong with having yeah. me talk about black and white. Christopher Walken, what can you say? This wall on the top of your studio at daylight, um, What's the story about this one? Why did he, what was he doing over by this wall? I don't know. He must have been sniffing something out. What didn't you say? <laughs> I don't know. Funny thing was, I was getting ready to shoot a straightforward, one of my, what I call my classic still lights, where I tell the actor to sit down and hold still. And Chris got up from the chair and actually just walked over to the wall. And again, this is one of the things that uh, it took me time to learn. And it's, it's the same thing we just spoke about, about being ready and open for that spontaneous moment those moments in between, and that's what this was. Boy, does this show the, the grain of the film. What year This was Tri-X, late afternoon light. Tri-X, 
Try, try, try it. <laughs> okay, I got me excited about Triax. You know, this was very late afternoon light, the last moments of rays of light, and it's often how I start a shoot. You're wanting a few tidbits. I always start in very close to become familiar with my subjects and to eliminate any distance so that there's a, we establish a bond early on. And then once I learn the angles, what I want to play up in the highlights, play down in the shadows, then I'll step back and then I'm, I'm, I'm pretty well know where I'm, how I'm going to position uh, the talent in front of my lens. As I recall at one of your seminars, I remember this well, back up and zoom in. What, what to, what's that all about? Back up, I remember it. Sometimes people get too complacent and they're standing in front of the talent and if uh, it's too tight, they'll just widen the lens. And this way, you know, it tends to oftentimes create a lens that's perhaps too wide angle for a closer portrait. And you're better off, I mean, for the way I shoot, people shoot differently. Irving Penn, as you know, shot slightly wider portraits. I mean, for me, an 85 millimeter lens is probably a normal lens. Oh. Uh, but not even a portrait lens. An 85 is a lens I would probably use to shoot somebody from the mid thigh up. And a portrait lens for me is a 180 to 250. Wow. Speaking in 35 millimeter terms. Yeah, I really like to use the portrait mode on my iPhone, Greg. <laughs> yeah, well, it works well. I don't have lenses. We go to Bob, as you call him. Yeah. <laughs> this was uh, for a cover for GQ magazine shot in New York in 1990. 1990. Yeah, it's um, it has that GQ look. Is that a GQ? You don't normally have the your subject put their hand up to the face and take that pose. Is that something you were doing because it was GQ? Um, no, it just seemed to be a really open, honest portrait of Bob, and I liked it. I didn't know him at this time. I think I want to say this might have been the first shoot we did together. Uh -huh. We ended up shooting a bunch of stuff together after this. We worked on a lot of projects, but good guy. He came to my 60th, my 50th birthday party at my studio, and I remember he was so nervous because there were so many people there. Now, I've gone black and white crazy here for a while, but then this photo really stands out to me. It couldn't be in black and white. Well, it could, but it, <laughs> I like it in color. I just love her soft pastel skin. Yeah. The makeup artist was brilliant, as you can see. I mean, the makeup is so subtle. It's so soft. And it's elegant. It really kind of frames up uh, Jody's face beautifully, I think. Um, natural light? Natural light in my daylight cage that you know, I built. Incredible photo. Greg, we're ending up here. Um, what's going on this, this here? This is Jaiman Hansu. And uh, it's funny because he's a was initially a model that everybody had shot, all of us that were kind of working around the period of the uh, mid to late 80s, early 90s. And uh, we'd all done portraits and nudes of this gentleman. And when I published my book, my third book called Inside Life, I thought, I don't want to put a big celebrity on the cover, so I'll, but I like this picture of Jaiman. And ironically, uh, he went on to star in, you know, Blood Diamond, Amistad, a lot of movies. So um, what we did here is we did a mud mask, Russell. Uh -huh. And then I just said to him, and as a background in modeling, I mean, he was wonderful at just delivering the goods. It's a difference between shooting a model and of celebrity. Celebrities more or less kind of do what they feel they're, they want to do. It's harder for you to get, you can direct them and get them to go so far in most cases, but in but pretty much they're their own uh, own man, so to speak. I want this book. When's this book coming out? Well, with any luck, it's going to print beginning tomorrow, believe it or not, after about three and a half years of hard labor. Uh, it should be out late, uh, late summer for sure. Uh, wow in Europe and, and probably in the States, maybe you can probably order it by late summer, I'm sure, from Tenois on Amazon, I'm sure. Do you have anything, some inspirational advice to designers, photographers uh, about photography that you might close this event with? Well, I don't know, Russell, you know, we've been talking today a little bit about shadow detail and, and, and highlights and everything. And I, I always say that it's not what you say in the highlights but what you don't say in the shadows that keeps people coming back to a picture. And I think that's really what's important. Wow. When I, when I first started shooting Russell, all my pictures looked like overlit postage stamps. And it really wasn't until I started taking the light off the center focal point of the camera that I started to find myself and develop my style as a photographer. So Greg, I, I just have to thank you so much for taking the time. You've done hundreds, if not thousands of interviews, but Greg, You've never done an interview with Russell Preston Brown. I, first. I have not. <laughs> so 
I appreciate it, Russell. You've also been very kind in my slow, slowly developing digital steps, and you've been there all the way, and I appreciate all of your help as well. I'll see you, Greg. Thank you so much. Thank you for tuning into this episode of The Russell Brown Show. If you want to watch more great interviews like this one or discover amazing tutorials, then be sure and go to russellbrown.com. You'll find all my latest content at that location.